Well, welcome back to the original Star Wars. We begin uh, episode six, and uh, we always like to review what is the premise of this study of, of Star Wars. Um, in reading scripture, um, I've known for years, like many of you have in Isaiah 14, that Lucifer is called a morning star, and Jesus Christ in Revelation 22 is called the bright and morning star. And so we have two stars. Oftentimes angels in the Bible are referred to as stars. We see the conflict between these two. But once again, note that Jesus is the bright and morning star, not just the morning star. We have, in our series so far, have pulled out phrases that have defined or made it very easy for us to remember where we've been in each of the lessons. In episode one is called The Fall, and that was about the fall of Lucifer and his angels, and where he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Paradise Lost was the Garden of Eden, and it was the Lord God that said to Eve, what have you done? You have no idea by sinning what you have done. The Battle of Uz was about Job, and Job's wife said to him, curse God and die. Moses in the middle, it was about Michael and the battle of Satan over the body of Moses. And Michael, the archangel of the Lord, knew the total way of victory was not in what he could do, but in what the Lord God Jehovah could do and would do. And so that statement is the Lord rebuke you. The porter on Persia had to do with Daniel in his latter years and God gave him a glimpse and a vision um, of the real battles that are going on, the spiritual battles, and he got a physical look at them. And the Lord challenged uh, Daniel and left him with this message, even though you're tired and, and old in years, stand upright. Don't, uh, in our latter years, we don't need to slouch spiritually. We need to stand firm and right and, and walk with God. The nemesis in the Negev is where we are today, and the key phrase will be, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou worship. We're going to the temptations of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and follow along with me as I read them, please. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. He said to him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, and Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said unto him, All these things will I give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him. Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Back in the Garden of Eden in our second lesson, Paradise Lost, we understood and we looked at the three types of sins, the three types of the way that temptation came to Adam and to Eve. And these are duplicated again here. Um, the premise for that is found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17, where John says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We're looking at those three areas. And if you're going to be tempted and tested, it will come in one and or more of those areas in your Christian life. You can bank on it. There's no other place that they will come from. And so while Adam and Eve didn't pass the test, we're going to see how Jesus passed it and how 
he set an example for you and, and, and me to live our Christian life. In Matthew 3, Jesus has been baptized, and the Bible says the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. And there we pick up the story. Here's a short map for you to look at, and I would probably call your attention more to the insert on the right-hand side that you get a pan more of a panorama view of the Holy Land along the Dead Sea area. That is called the Judean wilderness, or in the Bible sometimes it calls the wilderness. Some other places it would be called the Negev, N-E-G-E-V, hence the title of this lesson, the nemesis, the enemy in the, in the wilderness or in the south desert area. So it encompasses all this, and this is de very, very desert land. Very, very few things grow out in that area. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The word then is in the, in the Greek at that time, and it's used 90 times in the book of Matthew. And what is interesting about this phrase is Matthew is highlighting Jesus Christ as the true king of the Jews. Matthew is heavily Jewish oriented in its, his writing and in his focus. And what he is portraying, the, the eternal king of God has no beginning or no end. And Matthew is written when he uses these, the word then, meaning at that time, he's, he's just making a seamless story right throughout the book. He says with the Messiah, there's really no break in the action. Jesus was, was constantly at work uh, doing the things that the Messiah was prophesied to do and that he was the true king of the Jews. Tempted in here means to put to a test with the intent to do evil. So Satan comes to him trying the intent and the motive is well, I'm going to get him to do, I'm going to get him to sin and do wrong. Devil always means devil or slanderer. He, and the key thing in, in this study is Satan knows the word of God very well. And make no bones about it, Satan knows scripture and he quotes scripture as scripture and says it's written. It has the authority of scripture. It is the word of God. He quotes that and he doesn't, he doesn't deny that. That's not, that was not up for debate. And so understand while he knows the scripture, he knows how to subvert it and to pervert it and to twist it. And he did that with Adam and Eve. He tried it with Jesus. He does it with us. The very first area we would say would be the lust of the flesh versus the word of God. And when he had fasted 40 days, 40 nights, he was after word hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. The word if here means sense. Not only Satan has conceded that the word of God is the true word of God and stands as authority. In this phrasing, he is actually saying, since you are the word of, since you are the son of God, Satan knew who he was talking to and he conceded that ground too, since he just simply said, I know who you are. And since you are the son of God, then let's see if you can really pull off some of these really big tasks I'm gonna give you to do and I've got a reward to go along with them. And the word be, be made bread means to become, meaning he literally was going to change stones or rocks into loaves of bread. Um, Jesus had the power to do that should he, had he wanted to. He raised dead people and healed diseased people that had had the disease for life. Um, if he could do that, he could make some rocks a bakery without any problem. But he answered and said, it's written, every man, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus and all three of these temptations will answer Satan using scripture, and that's the key. The word but means, yes, Satan, what you said is you have quoted it, but you've quoted it out of, misquoted out of context. And the word but means, but except, Jesus said, okay, but you've said that, except it, re it means this. It is, it is written, it stands with authority, that man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Not just the words and the parts of the scripture that we like, but all of them. So the attack back is from Deuteronomy 8.3. And if you look at the latter part of the verse, neither did the fathers know that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth uh, of the Lord doth man live. So scripture is, is once again used to counter this. There's also the pride of life in verses 5 to 7 versus the wisdom of God. The devil took him up to the holy city, that's Jerusalem, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Took him means took him or the, he led them. Satan led the way, he said, okay, let me run something else by you here. And he said unto him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. The word charge means command or order. It's, a, it's amazing and an incredible thought to, to understand it and know that Jesus at any time had angels that, could, that were at his beck and call, that it could have moved in and done things. They were at his command. All he had to do is speak it and that they would carry you up, meaning if Jesus would jump off of this high corner of the walls of Jerusalem uh, for this reward, that he, could, he wouldn't die. He, the, he could just ask the angels to catch him an inch off of the ground before it hit, and it'd pick him up, lest, he said, so that you wouldn't even hurt your foot. They, nothing, had, nothing had happened with your feet. They wouldn't touch the ground. And um, this was what he promised for a reward. Notice the blue arrow, and we're looking from the Mount of Olives to the, e the southeastern corner of the Temple Mount. Uh, that is not the temple with the gold dome building. That is Islamic controlled. It's the Dome of the Rock. Uh, but this is an actual place where Jesus would have been taken and Satan would have said jump from here. Um, it's been pointed out that this was a bigger jump not because the wall was cut down but because over years landfill went in there and you can see how it's been built up from even in the forefront of the picture in the lower left. Um, it was for the road to go in there. Um, it was probably at least a 70 foot leap is what it would have been. Jesus said to him, it's written again, do not, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Tempt here means a decisive test. You don't, he said, you don't put God to a test. The scripture is going to bear this out that you don't tempt God. It's like the kid, uh, the kid that prays right before a test. Lord, if you just l let me get a good grade on this test, then, then I'll be good for the next week and I'll obey my mom and dad. That's, that's a decisive test. That's the Lord, if you do this and I'll behave this, we should be doing that already. And that should not even come into play in our lives. <clears throat> but as Christians, we find ourselves, Lord, if you could just give me a job or Lord, if you'd heal my body, then I'll do this. God doesn't deal in bargaining chips that if we ask something of him, then we'll do something. It's the Lord promises us things. And that's based upon our Christian growth and our serving him that it comes. So we don't want to tempt the Lord God, our God by throwing crazy requests out there that we're asking amiss. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Messiah. The last one's the lust of the eyes. It's verses the worship of God. And again, the devil took him into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. The brightness, the splendor. They were incredible what he saw. An artist concept. And he said to him, all these I'll give you if you'll fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. He just told him and said, Satan, get away. Go, get out of here, you adversary. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the word serve means to work for, to 
serve, it can mean serve in a religious manner, serving the Lord at your church or at the synagogue in those cases and doing good and taking care of the poor. And it does, it does carry a, rem a remote meaning of work for a reward. And we do, not, we do not serve the Lord for the reward, but we understand that God has promised faithful service that there are rewards along the way and there are rewards in heaven. But that's not the goal. The goal is to worship the Lord our God and because we love the Lord, we serve Him. Deuteronomy 6.13 Fear the Lord your God, serve Him only, and take your oaths in His name. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Means that in the Greek that they brought him food to eat. Well, the conclusion, and this was not a long lesson, is something in a unique, different way. I ran across years ago, and it's actually in a book somewhere that John Maxwell had written, and it was a different way to outline these temptations other than the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus uh, was tempted, and I'm going to run these over and by you just in closing this, the, at this time. Um, when I saw these, I got to think that, you know, sometimes we just hear the same verse over and over. It gets, I'll use the word old, and sometimes we need a fr fresh look to get a fresh look at ourselves. And I love what he put, that quality Christians are prepared in the wilderness. Jesus was taken away out, just away from everybody. And, and I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need to be by myself. I need to get away, and I just need to think, I need to pray, I need to just examine. Um, plan, do things. And quality Christians are going to be prepared and be made in these down times, in these away times. Jesus, in the first temptation, the temptation was to be self-sufficient. I don't need, I, I can do that. I can turn bread. I can make bread out of stones. I can do it all myself. I can feed myself. I can take care of me. And I'm afraid so much of our Christian life is that it's we do everything in our power and our strength, and then when we can't do it or we get in trouble, we ask God for help. We ask for bread out of stones. And it's so easy to live our lives in the flesh. It's so easy to, to rest and bank on our talents, our abilities, our minds, influence that we may have, instead of just trusting the Lord. Let God make the, the bread for us. We don't, we don't need to get to that point. The second temptation was one to be spectacular. Hey, I'm taking you on to the tallest point in Jerusalem here, and the way up high place, and this is a cool thrill ride. And you, if you jump off, you can become spectacular and have angels fly and people know that you could make them visible and they could see you be caught and everything and everybody would just say wow you're a prophet you're god and they worship you and there are times that we as god's people we are very tempted to be spectacular I, uh, bigger and better more magnificent fireworks and jumbo buildings and gigantic things, and I'm using very descriptive words that can be attached to anything. And we need, yes, we need to be dynamic people. We need, I'll use the word, we need to be spectacular, but not be that for ourselves. Because it would have been Jesus who would have called the angels. The show would have been in his hands, not in God. We serve an incredible God, a magnificent God. And I could use the word spectacular. What God can do is beyond spectacular. But the temptation is there for us. The last one, the temptation to be powerful. Well, if you just bow down to me, I'll give you control over these cities. Be powerful is to be controlling, is to have be master over, to manipulate. And we live, we live in a world of power. 
We always have. It, were the, it was the power people that killed Jesus. Because Jesus up exposed them for what they were and who they were. And as I said, we live in, in our country, locally, and our, even our churches. There are power plays and power things. And that's a, that's a common temptation among people, among even Christian people, that we manipulate and we, we, become, we make a name for ourselves instead of we make a name for God. And every time I walk into class before you get here, I walk among the tables and I pray. And if you're listening to this, before you go and go out there where if you're going to sing or you teach or you preach or you, you have a ministry for the Lord somewhere, you need, you need to make sure that that's not yours. You need to make sure that, give that back to God again. I, it's real easy for me to take possession of things that are God's. And, and I do it. But the, the results and the blessings and the power is not in what I do, but it's in what Christ will do for me. Pray and give things back to the Lord. Jesus had it right. Know the word of God. Know your scripture. Where Adam and Eve failed, Jesus succeeded. Adam and Eve misquoted God's word like Satan did in the garden for their advantage. Jesus quoted God's word in the wilderness to bring glory to his Father. Victory is a summary of this day.